Hey, Chelsea, how are you? Great, thanks. So I am so excited that you joined us today. We had several nurses interested in hearing from you and hearing what it was that you had to teach, and we really want to learn from you. So um, David has been a pediatric oncology nurse at UCSF Children's Hospital for 12 years. He started as a new grad, so that's going to answer so many of your questions, those of you who submitted questions and wanted to know if this was a good place for you to start. So he's going to be able to answer that for you. Um, he started as an art major and found his way into nursing. So we're all super lucky because as you know, nursing is an art all on its own. So David, welcome and just introduce yourself a little bit. Hey, um, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, all of that is correct. Um, I have been a pediatric oncology nurse for 12 years now and I absolutely love it. Um, it's not a path that um, I knew much about before I was a nurse and um, you know, it's been a really interesting journey that I'm happy to um, to tell you guys about. That's great. I'd love to do a little icebreaker, and I want to know, what's your funniest nursing story? There are so many funny things that happen with kids. Um, if I had to pick one, I would say, um, you know, we do lots of novel therapies on our floor. Um, and one particular therapy we're doing was called uh, blinitumumab. And it's a monoclonal antibody that allows um, patients with leukemia to, you know, go into remission and eventually make it to a bone marrow transplant, you know, where they can hopefully get a completely new immune system and, you know, move on with their lives. Um, but we were giving this therapy to a teenage boy who I'd taken care of quite a bit. I knew him really well. And I had him all hooked up. There were wires going everywhere. Every time he farted, you know, something beeped. Um, and, you know, I was keeping a very close eye on him, you know, looking at the monitors, but I was kind of giving him his space, you know, the warriors were on and he was, you know, he wanted to watch his game. Um, so I was sitting there at the nursing station and I noticed that he went into complete apnea, which means he wasn't breathing. So I ran to his room and he was just sitting there kind of watching the game. I was really kind of surprised I had burst in. So I left and, um, you know, after making sure he was okay, and I went back to the nursing station and, you know, two minutes later, the exact same thing happened. Monitors, no, no breathing at all. And I once again ran to his room and this kept on happening for like, you know, 10, 15 minutes. Then I realized that he was watching the Warriors there in the playoffs. And every time Steph Curry went up for a three pointer, he would hold his breath for about 30 seconds. And then the computer would think that he was apneic. So, so once we figured that out, I turned off the monitor for a half hour and, you know, let them be. That's awesome. <laughs> and kids are so funny. I have some amazingly funny stories from the PICU, too. Their, their kids are amazing. So, yeah, it's amazing populations to work with. Absolutely. So when did you decide, so you said prior to nursing school, you didn't really have a whole lot of background about pediatric oncology. So when did you decide that's the path you wanted to take as a new grad? So, you know, I don't know, you know, many of you go to different nursing schools and there's different parameters for what allows you into that school. My school made us decide what um, our specialty was going to be as we applied. So I applied as an adult acute um, nurse practitioner, and that was what I thought would be a good route for me. Um, and then I had my first pediatric rotation and I had, you know, just this amazing experience with this child that made me realize right then and there that I had to be a a pediatric nurse. Um, I was with, um, I was shadowing another nurse and um, she had something to do. So she wanted me to watch this child who was just completely losing it. And this child has had a disease called Stephen Johnson's, Johnson syndrome, yes, which is a really horrible autoimmune disease where you, these kids get sores all over their bodies. It's just, it's, you know, it's horrible. And I had no idea what to do with this child. Um, she was crying. She was freaking out. She had no parents in the room. And I just picked her up and started singing to her. Um, and she immediately went quiet. You know, she like did that thing that kids do when their head just comes like hard down onto your chest. And, you know, it was a really pivotal moment for me realizing that kids, you know, were the, the people who I really need to work with. Um, and this was before I had kids of my own. Um, so that I think it was the next day I went to my advisor and told her that I was not going to be an adult nurse, um, which had its own repercussions for my own education, but it was honestly the best decision I could have made. 
That's awesome. So, so many people want to know, like, you know, do I start here? Is that okay for a new grad? What if I can't get into this program right when I um, graduate? So if you had, you think that this is a good place to start as a new grad after you've done it yourself, do you feel like you would recommend it further? I mean, I think you really have to follow your heart on what uh, specialty you want to go into. Yeah. Um, you know, the great thing about nursing is that you're not locked down to whatever you're doing. So you can start off in med search and then move on to pediatric oncology, or you can start off in the ICU and go to outpatient. I mean, that's the real beauty of what we do. Um, I was a new grad. I survived. I have many, many scary, horrible tales to tell about being a new grad, but I don't know if those would necessarily not happen on a general floor or on a heart floor or, you know, a transplant floor. Um, I have to say that pediatric oncology is immensely complicated. I am surprised that I didn't do something that severely hurt somebody over the first two years of my job because I barely could spell oncology when I first started as a pediatric oncology nurse. Um, so I think you know you have to take everybody's stories you know with a grain of salt. Um, what I think is most important is what kind of support are you going to get as a new grad, um, and how receptive you are to learning, making mistakes and owning up to those mistakes um, and, you know, just moving forward. So I think nobody should be bound by how hard it's going to be. Mm -hmm. you, you can do whatever you need to do. You just need to have the passion for it um, and have the resilience. But yeah, it, it truly sucked um, for a long time that I didn't think I was gonna, actually going to move forward with my career. Um, but everybody has a different experience. They're, the new grads that come in now are so amazing. They're so much more qualified than I am when I was a, a, a new grad that they usually do pretty darn well. Oh, that's really good to know. Um, a question just came in. Is it possible to be a pediatric oncology nurse with your ADN versus your BSN? It is possible. Um, not at my hospital anymore. So, um, you know, nursing is really changing a lot these days. Um, you know, there's a doctorate in nursing now that didn't exist, you know, probably 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So most hospitals are moving towards a compliance where they want full BSNs for all their nurses. That's not the case with UCSF right now, um, meaning many, many nurses I know have ADNs or they have certificates and they're kind of grandfathered in. I am one of those nurses because um, when I decided to change my specialty from adult to pediatrics, um, it was assumed that I would be able to go on to get my um, nurse practitioner in pediatrics, but it didn't end up working out. So I got a job straight out um, after that first year of, um, of RN training and never finished my education as I intended. So I have a functional ADN um, and it doesn't hold me back, but it will hold you back to getting a job at most major hospitals in California. I don't know about across the nation. I think, you know, being a nurse in Florida is very different than being a nurse in California. It's very true. And I'll chime in a little bit of information as well. Um, it depends on the, uh, the facility. It depends on if they're reaching for magnet status. It depends magnet on if, yeah, if they're a educational institution. Do they provide a residency program? So many factors play into that. So I think the best bet for you, if you're wanting to get into a pediatric oncology unit and that's your specific goal, I think you need to make some contacts get on LinkedIn, look and see who you can connect with, um, with a pediatric oncology manager, nurse, anybody, anybody, and uh, just reach out to them and say, hey, do I have to have a BSN or can I get my ADN and get into a pediatric oncology unit? Okay, so Absolutely. do you have anything to add to that? Sorry, David. No, I, I think um, I think that's all true. I think especially um, contacting specific people who work um, on the floors is a great idea. Yeah. So say someone has an absolute passion for pediatric oncology, and that's just not an option. They don't take you without an ex without experience. They don't take you because there's no positions open, whatever that looks like. If there was one area that you would say, uh, or maybe a couple areas, mm -hmm. you would say they could get really great foot in the door if they worked here or there. Where is a few places you might recommend? 
Uh, you mean specific institutions or like types no, of no, places? no, like units, maybe an, an adult oh, college unit or maybe just a standard pediatric unit. What do you think would lead well into pediatric oncology? I mean, I think a standard med search unit would be great. I mean, honestly, every floor has its challenges. Um, I don't, there are many things that, you know, nurses who take care of kids who get liver transplants and um, and kidney transplants, you know, they're all on immunosuppressants. There's, they face many similar issues that mm -hmm. the kids who I work, work with face. Um, but I don't think that, you know, nursing is a kind of thing where you're learning how to think a certain way. You're learning how to organize. You're learning how to, you know, put out these psychosocial fires all the time. Um, and they occur everywhere. You know, you're going to find these challenges everywhere. Um, I do think it's probably important to kind of develop that pediatric experience because it's a whole different ball game. Like I wouldn't know what to do with a 70 year old man. Um, and an adult nurse probably would like have no idea what to do with a baby that weighs three pounds. Like you just got to um, develop a certain skill set that is directly related to pediatrics. Yeah. So any, any place that the kids are besides the playground. Yes. Agreed. So are there pediatric oncology residency programs available? Um, there definitely are, I'm sure not at my hospital. Um, the, the kids who get hired and they're all kids to me now, because I'm like 20 years older than most of them, right. um, they all have experience coming out of school with pediatric oncology. So they all, um, have done a capstone project. I'm not sure if that is something that's national or not, but, um, they've all done capstone projects, which, which basically is like a internship on a floor and they've basically shadowed a nurse for six weeks or they've done a, you know, some kind of major project in pediatric oncology. Um, they all, it's going to be really hard to get a job, at least at my hospital, unless you show that you are very, very dedicated to that population and that you have experience with it. Um, I am a total outlier. I got my job 12 years ago and they probably would not um, have hired me now. The way I got my job was pretty interesting and kind of different than most people probably experienced. Sure. So I'll add into that as well. If you're looking for a residency program specifically, you want to look at educational um, institutions, institutions that are kind of paired with the university or those that almost always have a residency program available. available. Now, from my own experience um, at the university hospital that I used to work at, we had a pediatric residency program as a whole. And in that pediatric residency program, you chose two to three tracks to be on. Uh, or maybe you chose the oncology residency program. And again, you were on several tracks that you would choose maybe the bone marrow unit, the pediatric oncology unit, and the adult oncology unit, I don't know. Um, but that's how it worked where I was from. So maybe look into university options that have residency programs if that's what you're looking into. So that was part of your nursing education? I actually didn't go through the residency program. Um, okay. This was 15 years ago, but I trained a lot of preceptees and, and gotcha. new nurses that were part of the residency program. Uh -huh. Really, it's like having another job. You have your unit work, and then you also have projects and assignments and separate work that's kind of helping you through those rough patches of becoming a new nurse. Um, uh -huh or shaping you into that nurse that you want to be. Uh, it's a great program. It is just very different than the way you and I started our first year. Yeah. For sure. So are there specific certifications for pediatric oncology or just general oncology that would cross over if you didn't get into pediatric oncology right away? Um, yeah, I mean, there, there definitely are. On my floor, there are certifications that you are required for you to do your job. Um, one is called AFON, um, and I don't exactly remember what that stands for, but That's okay. um, American Pediatric Oncology Nurses, maybe, or Association of Pediatric Oncology Nurses. And that's basically a long course that you take um, learning about chemotherapy and how to administer it and why we, we administer it. And you're not basically allowed to, to do that part of your job until you fulfill that requirement. But there are lots of other certificates that um, that many nurses go for um, that are not required, and you know, there's there many of them have utility. You know, 
education is a great thing and you know, it furthers your practice and makes you better and safer and can kind of lead you down a path that you know, maybe you didn't intend to do. Um, but there's definitely a certified pediatric oncology nurses um, certificate and then there's a pediatric nurse um, certificate. And I don't have any of those, honestly. Um, past my initial education, my priority has really been to uh, become a better nurse on the floor and I have have not run out of things to learn. Right. But if you do have time to do those things, I think it's a great thing. Um, it's a challenge when you've you know got kids and a job and other things going on, but I definitely encourage anybody who has the time and the and the will to put that study time in to, to do it. Absolutely. So what's a typical shift look like for you from start to finish? So um, we start at seven, we end at 730. There is an hour lunch break sometime in between, usually if things aren't crazy. Um, the way my unit works is that there is a um, oncology, it's got 24 beds, and then bone marrow transplant has 13 beds. Every nurse who works my floor works both units. So you show up, you have no idea where you're gonna end up unless you were there the day before and you typically will get your assignment back, which is not guaranteed, which is one of the great lessons I learned actually as a nurse. When you, you, know, you have this assignment that you love, that two-year-old who breaks your heart and that teenage girl who you just love talking to and you show up and you don't get them back, you never ask for a different assignment because it's, it's hard being a charge nurse Things are, there's so many moving pieces that you don't understand um, that are part of just like making the, the floor work, making these patients safe. Some patients need to be switched around. So generally you'll get your assignment back, but um, if you don't, you just kind of, you know, grit your teeth and bear it. So if you are put on the BMT side, these patients are, you know, pretty acutely ill. Um, they take lots of work. They take lots of monitoring. Uh, you'll have anywhere from two to three patients, depending on how sick the patients are and your experience level. Um, if you're on oncology, you'll get three to four patients, and it's more of a revolving door. Like you could start with three patients, you know, one will begin a transfusion and they'll go home, you'll accept another, that patient will, you know, have been there for a week, their counts are back up and they're ready to go home, then you'll send them home, you'll get another. Um, so I'd say on the oncology side, it's a much more um, moving, labile process, you know, you never know what's going to happen throughout the day. Being T, more than usual, you just have those patients that you started with and you kind of go on through there. Um, and then, you know, the rest of the day is just kind of a crapshoot. Um, you get used to the therapies that you're providing um, and you're monitoring the kids and making sure that they're doing, doing well. But um, it's, you know, it's the days start to blend into each other <laughs> after a while. Yeah, sure. So what would you say the top three challenges are for pediatric oncology? So, I mean, first of all, it's like tremendously complicated field. You know, the pharmacology, the physiology, I've been there for 12 years and there's still things where I'm like still trying to figure out. And honestly, like I didn't go to med school for eight years, so I don't have the, the background to, to, you know, fully understand all of it. But I think experience is, almost as important as the knowledge that you acquire in school. Sure. Um, so I think kind of educating yourself about, about all the ins and outs of the medicines, the therapies, why we're doing them, you know, you know, all these things, it, it keeps on changing. So, I mean, where I work, it's an educational hospital. So you've got residents, you've got fellows, you've got attendings, and everybody is constantly educating each other. And, you know, that's one of the really great parts about it. Um, Aside from that, there is a very real emotional toll that caring for people in general takes on you, um, and let alone kids. Uh, I mean, I've taken some, I've taken care of some of these kids since they were, you know, two or three years old, and now they're teenagers, and you know they're still suffering, you know, through relapses or they get secondary cancers or. What well, my point is is that you get very attached to these people, they're part of your family in many ways, even though, you know, when you go home, you've got your own kids to take care of. So there's um, an emotional balance that I think is, you know, it takes a constant kind of check in with yourself on how you're doing, you know, because when somebody dies in front of you, it's, I mean, it's, it's very real. Um, and you're going to experience that no matter where you nurse, but yeah. um, there's something very special about the relationship you have, not only with these kids, 
but with their parents who are basically your peers in many ways. Um, and I think the third challenge is, you know, work life balance, um, which is once again, it's probably not native just pediatric oncology, but being able to shut off when you go home and you know, when you do that, that mic drop with your phone is really important. And, uh, it took me many years to figure that out. And I still have days where I am a complete wreck when I get home. Yeah. Um, you know, depending on, you know, if, you know, if somebody died or if somebody was very sick or if just my assignment was a giant clusterfuck. So you just, you know, that balance is really difficult and challenging. Sure. And there was lots of questions that came in um, about that specific thing. How do you manage that emotional stress? And someone specifically asked if you personally have ever needed to take a leave of absence or days off to give yourself mental clarity or a mental break. How do you handle that? I mean, I've definitely taken sick days when I didn't have a cold. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I like to think of those as mental health days. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that everybody's going to find that they have different strategies to deal with life. Right. Like, you know, it's not just being a nurse, it's being a person, you know, you're going to encounter some really hard times. Um, and, you know, everybody will have a different way of getting through those times. Um, I have personally never taken a leave of absence, but um, I have called in sick <laughs> and said, I'm not coming back today because I need to, I need a break from this. Um, I think it's really helpful to, um, to to constantly check in with yourself. I was seeing a psychologist for a long time before I was even a nurse, um, because you know I think everybody needs to to talk to somebody about you know the things that bother them and the things that are hard in life. Um, and I think the same strategy is is totally app applicable to being a nurse. Um, yeah, um, having a really balanced life, I think is really important. So, you know, maintaining your diet, maintaining your exercise, maintaining your, your social relationships outside of work are the things that allow you to keep on going in, even though it's, it, there will be days when it's the absolute last place you want to be. Um, but when you step into somebody's room and, you know, they're smiling because they haven't seen you for weeks and you are able to kind of um, continue, you know, a relationship with a, you know, with a person who you've known for a long time or their parents, it's, it's definitely worth it. But yeah, it's going to really be hard sometimes. I will not lie. Does your unit specifically have resources available to you all? You mentioned those long-term patients. Um, mm -hmm. when, when one of those passes or it was a particularly difficult case, do you guys have any sort of resources or processing that your unit does? Uh-huh. I'd say that there is a formal process and there's an informal process. Okay. Um, and all of it is kind of messed up right now because of COVID, because mm. um, there's not people really, you know, meeting together in large groups. Yeah. But when there is a, a very difficult code situation or somebody, a long-term patient dies, um, there's often um, a group that meets after that, which is led by one of the um, kind of spiritual care um, providers. Okay. And I've never been to one of those. It's, it's not how I like to process. Um, I'd rather go for a run and, you know, have a beer with a friend than be in a circle and talk about my feelings. Sure. But that's, that is completely me. A lot of people find those things really, really helpful. Um, there's also, um, psychological support. I think free sessions with the psychologist, um, at least to get you started on where you need to go. Um, and if you need help beyond those like eight or 10 sessions that they provide, you know, at some point in your career, then, you know, you can definitely get help. The informal process is it all happens in the break room with your colleagues. And I think that's where most people really find their comfort because nobody really understands these patients and these processes and, you know, these phenomena of living and dying as much as your colleagues who deal with it all the time. Right. So, you know, sitting down, at, you know, during your break and just talking to your friends about how you feel about something, I think is a really effective way of, of dealing with it. I agree. But there's so much happiness that happens too. Um, it's not, I think a lot of people have this idea that it's just sadness and, um, and pain, but it's, it's so far from the truth. Um, 
as in life, there's so many elements and aspects to, you know, the things we experience and you can't have the good without the bad. That's very true. Very true. So what do you think makes a successful nurse in your specific area? I think um, you need to have curiosity. You need to, um, you know, want to know why everything's happening because when you don't have that curiosity, you'll make a mistake because um, as an experienced nurse now, I'll look at an order and I'll say, that does not make sense. I don't understand why they're ordering this um, because it doesn't um, meet up with my experience. Yeah. So without, yeah, without that curiosity, you're not going to question an order and you can, you know, you're a gatekeeper to the patient um, and it's your responsibility. So if something happens, you know, it's not technically my fault, it's a doctor's order. But if I didn't take the initiative to go talk to that doctor and ask him why they ordered IVIG when it was given two days ago um, or whatever the, the case may be, um, you know, that's on you. So being super curious and um, eager to, to know what's going on is really important. Um, patience is super important. Um, I've learned this with my own children and I learn it every day with the kids at, at work. You can't go in with your own agenda of course, you have your agenda. You want to deliver, you know, this, this this care. You want to get to the next room. You've got 20 different things going on. But sometimes you just need to step into a room and just feel what's going on and let that patient as much as possible dictate how it's going to happen. Because there's kids, they spend their lives in the hospital. They have no control. And, you know, it, it must be such a frightening thing. And, I mean, it really chokes me up to like, to imagine what it feels like to, to be a child in this situation where you've been isolated, you don't know what's going on, you're scared, you're sick. And um, unless you give that child some kind of control, you're just not gonna have a successful relationship with them, mm -hmm. um, personally or medically. Um, and then, I mean, I guess that kind of just goes right into my next would be just compassion for, um, for, these, these kids, compassion for their parents, compassion, compassion for your, you know, your grumpy coworkers and compassion for yourself. Um, I think if you can't have that, you're not going to be a success. Um, and then I think it's super helpful if you are a social person, because nursing is probably one of the professions where you are going to be interacting with your colleagues the most. I mean, that's why the idea that we're socially isolating from our colleagues right now is such a joke because you're shoulder to shoulder with them, you know, checking high risk meds um, or delivering chemotherapy. Everything you do as a nurse needs um, needs another person almost. Uh, and, you know, and then when you have a code, you've got, you know, 10 people around the bed, just like right scrunch up next to each other. Right. So I think um, being able to, you know, to talk with other people and learn from them is super important. And also, you know, you've got these parents who have been stuck in a room for six months with their kids, no joke. You know, they rarely go out. They're just always there. And you walk in and you see like how starving they are for like an adult conversation <laughs> with somebody who's not their child. Yeah. Um, so being able to deliver um, just kind of a dose of like normality to a parent is super, super useful. So being social and being able to talk and not being a robot is probably the most important thing. I mean, we're, we're all people. Some of us are sick, some of us are not, but we all will be at one point. Right. I really like those. Those are all great characteristics to have in any nurse, really, but specifically yeah. in pediatrics and more specifically in pediatric oncology. Um, something I like that you said is giving kids control. And some uh, and I'm sure you've seen this in your own practice, but in my experience in the pediatric ICU is some nurses just want to control the whole thing. You know, mm -hmm. no, I'm going to take your blood pressure right now. No, that's what I'm going to do right now. And you see those kids distant from you and you see that every time you walk in the room, you're they're terrified of your presence. Yeah. And I found that, um, like you were saying, giving them some control, I found that asking them like, okay, so I have this medicine here and I need to check your temperature and your blood pressure. Which would you like me to do first? Yes. Or what arm? You yeah, want a left exactly. arm or a right arm? 
whatever that looks like, which, which arm or leg, whichever that looks like, you know, however that looks for your specific patient, um, uh -huh. giving them those little choices opens a whole new world for you as the nurse. They trust okay. you. They know that they can um, have a say that they have some rights to their own body. Cause let's face it, like they have no rights. I'm going to do this. No, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Invasion. I mean, you're just like getting in there in their space in such a real way. And not only that, they have like these lines that are just entering their body, their chest, their, you know, every tube is going to them. And it's really like, it must be a, a such a um, out of body experience to, to not have control of your body that way. Agreed. Agreed. I think those are such great tips for everybody. So um, a few other questions came in. So uh, specifically, I, I believe that this nurse may have been an adult oncology nurse or maybe uh -huh. an adult nurse in general, but their specific question was, are there specific pediatrics when it comes to vesicin extravation, extravation, either with treating or preventing? What tips would you have for this nurse? So I, I've never worked with the adult popula population, so I don't know if there are any differences. I, I suspect there are not. Right. Um, so, you know, with us, it's it's all, there's many processes already there to help us. Um, the first is education. So you have to know which ed, which chemotherapies you're giving are vesicants. Um, so that's your first step. Mm -hmm. Second, um, almost all of our um, pediatric patients have central lines, which is a catheter that runs, you know, from their arm or their chest directly to their heart. And it's a large bore vein and any chemotherapy going through them is, is usually very safe. So m making sure that you're giving the chemotherapy through one of those is very important rather than a PIV. Um, whenever we give chemotherapy or whenever I give it, I always check blood return on our lines. So you know that's working, even if it's not a vesicant. I don't want etoposide going into somebody's, you know, chest tissue just because it's not gonna burn their skin. So making sure that you have a patent line is really important. Um, I have, in 12 years of my career, I have seen a, um, a vesicant injury maybe twice okay. and it is truly horrible um you don't want it to happen um there are therapies for it we have a drug called hydrolinase i think it's called and it's a bunch of injections that they um inject into basically what this is an open wound at that point to help it heal um so yeah it doesn't happen very often but it's because we educate ourselves and we are, you know, giving our chemotherapy safe, safely. But I, I doubt that there's too much difference between that and the adult population. And um, we were also talking before we went live. I think something between a pediatric and adult population, peds aren't as apt to tell you, like, this feels a little different than normal. And mm -hmm. an adult can say, like, this doesn't normally burn and it's burning now, which would cue you as the nurse to be more acutely aware of what's going on. Maybe check your line, check for patency, et cetera. Um, check for blood return, all of those good things. Uh -huh. But in the pediatric population, they're super resilient and their pain tolerance is incredible. So they're not going to tell you as promptly like, hey, this feels a little different or maybe they don't have the words to tell you yet. Mm -hmm. So those are some things too. Uh, what do you love most about your specialty? I mean, I, I love the kids. I love the lightness that they bring to the room. Um, I enjoy the kind of family-centered care that we provide. So, I mean, you've got these parents and their kids together, and you basically need to treat everybody. Mm -hmm. So everybody's got an issue. Some of it is sometimes it's not medical. But I think the, the coolest thing about my job that I had no idea about before I did it was the incredible age range of people I was going to be taking care of. I mean, the youngest patient I've ever had probably fit into the palm of my hand. He was like a preterm um, baby who had a uh, severe combined immune deficiency order, basically a, a disorder where these kids don't have a functioning immune system and they'll die without a bone marrow transplant or gene therapy. Okay. So he's just this, this tiny little being. And then the oldest patient I've ever taken care of was like a 30 year old with, you know, who had somehow developed a pediatric cancer. So we, oh. I don't know if this exists in other places, but we treat these people, you know, these late twenties, early thirties patients who have cancers that are very specific to pediatric populations because we know how to treat them. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's really fascinating. And then of course you have patients who have, you know, leukemia when they're 12 and then relapse after relapse, 
you know, followed by remissions, but followed by relapse, they find themselves being a 20 year old with the same disease. And um, you get to follow these lives, you get to be part of their lives. Sometimes it ends up in a really good place. Um, sometimes it doesn't, mm -hmm. but it's, it's valuable for me at least. So is it similar in the pediatric oncology world if you have a delayed patient, like a um, mentally delayed patient who uh -huh. had a pedi pediatric cancer, no matter how old they are, they still come to your unit? Um, you mean if they're, if they're adults? Yeah. So it, it sounds like that's the case, and even if it's not mentally delayed. So in the pediatric ICU, if uh -huh. the patient is like um, mentally a seven-year-old, uh -huh. they will come often to the pediatric ICU because they're mentally a seven-year-old. And even though they're 21, they'll still come to yeah. the ICU if we have room. Um, I have not experienced that, honestly. Okay, so uh, just if it's a pediatric cancer, they'll come to you. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, if they're if they're a adult with trisomy or some other right. um, disease that, you know, there's a kind of neurocognitive delay, um, unless they have a specific reason to come to us, they, they would be with an adult unit. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So what would you say the hardest parts of your job are? Um, I mean, I think I've touched on them a bit. Yeah. Um, you know, the really interesting thing about my job, which I also did not realize is that, you know, I work at an institution where we see many, many very sick kids. Mm -hmm. Um, and you, when that keeps happening over and over again, you get very sick kids, you know, the mortality and morbidity rate is very high. Um, and you don't realize that that's just not how it actually is. You know, seven, 60% to 90% of, um, of pediatric leukemia is completely curable. You know, these, these kids come in with leukemia and they, um, we get them to the hard parts. They go to outpatient and they spend two to three years doing their therapy and they move on with their lives. Um, but if you spent your life in the hospital, you would never realize that because the kids we see are so sick. Mm. Um, so I think the hardest part is just kind of like making that mental leap to understand that this is not the mean experience of everybody. Um, you know, people are, you're going to take care of people who are going to die and developing a kind of a mental roadmap for a mental and emotional roadmap for, for dealing with that is is super challenging and it's something that you're gonna you're gonna fail at many many times and that's okay because it's just a journey about how to you know be a person um but it's it's super challenging yeah you know it's it's not it it doesn't always make sense yeah absolutely so so many people have a side hustle as nurses because we only work three days a week I know you uh -huh. personally have authored a book. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it, why you started writing, and what that process has been like? Sure. So my main side hustle is being a dad. Um, I, I, I do work only three days a week. <laughs> um, and I'm a father of two kids. I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old, um, which is the best and the definitely the most challenging job that I've ever had, way harder than nursing. <laughs> so it gives me real compassion for the parents who are taking care of their own sick children. Yeah. Um, I did write a book recently and I'm still working out the publishing issues behind that, but, um, and I don't know if this is a side gig in the, you know, in the traditional way, because it's not necessarily a job I, or something I intend to make much money doing, but, um, as a nurse to children, um, I've, you know, seen all these stages that all my patients go through, you know, I've talked to, you know, teenagers about what it's like to to bank their sperm and, you know, prior to their chemotherapy and, and, you know, these kind of milestones in life that, you know, they're missing. Mm -hmm. I've taken care of babies, you know, who are kind of missing their own milestone developments. And um, I've seen so many ways that these kids and these parents have taught me how you could live your life and how you could be a parent and a person. Yeah. And, you know, it, it led me to write this book about the intersection of my life as a nurse and my life as a parent and the lessons I've learned from this place that I've been able to apply my, to my own parenting. And it doesn't mean I'm a parenting guru. I, I sometimes feel like the worst parent in the world, but that's why I decided to kind of really investigate this book. So my book is called Nurse Papa and, 
and it is it basically offers a series of meditations based on my experiences in the hospital with these kids and these parents. That's great. I can't wait till you get that published so that I can actually read it. Um, I love reading your blog and your Instagram posts that you guys, you just share little is excerpts of your book. And I love your insight and your wisdom that you're sharing throughout that. Um, it's always so great to read those. So thank you for sharing those. No problem. It's easy to write about wisdom. Um, it's harder to put that wisdom to practice. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I feel like I am really good about kind of teasing apart these these ideas, but it's it's hard to be a good dad, just as it's hard to be a good nurse. Um, so part of the point of the book was to, 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 to offer a framework for how you could, you know, be a better parent and be a better person. But it doesn't mean that I am a better person. <laughs> No, man, we're all a constant work in progress, right? Like yeah. you pass on knowledge to other people and people give their knowledge and wisdom to you. And we're always just constantly, hopefully all of us are all on the path of continually learning and growing. Absolutely. So if no one else has questions, um, Becca, I see that you asked if there were suggestions on trying to find a pediatric oncology job. We touched on that early on in the interview, like very first thing, but do you have anything that you'd like to add to that that we didn't already cover? She's saying that um, even over an hour of drive away is the closest thing. Um, she's not finding anything in her area. As far as getting a pediatric oncology? Yeah. Job? Do you have any other recommendations besides the things we touched on? LinkedIn, connecting with nurses. I mean, from it's not going to be it's not going to work for you now because um, you know we're not allowed to be within six feet of most people, but. I'll tell you how I got my job is um, I was a new grad. No, I was not even a new grad. I'd still had a month to graduate. I walked up to the pediatric oncology floor. I knocked on the manager's door. He liked the looks of me and he interviewed me on the spot. It was an informal interview, but um, it got my foot in the door and um, and it got me a formal interview and I got the job. I mean, I think 600 people applied to that position. They only hired six people. So I guess my point is, is that Putting a face to the name is really important, whether that means getting a job as a PCA on the floor or um, somehow inserting yourself <laughs> in somebody else's um, you know, area. It's really important. Um, if there's not a pediatric oncology available in your area, I mean, it just means you have to move. Um, I've always told people, like, it does not matter where your first two years in nursing are. If you can't get a job, if you live in California and I've tried to get a job for two years and you can't do it. Move to New York, move to Florida, and, you know, get your get your minimum two years experience and then and then live where you want to live. But um, I think it requires lots of flexibility at first. And I know it's hard for most people if they have a family or if they have financial concerns. But um, if you can, I think you just need to go where the work is. Sounds good. Thank you for all your wisdom. I like to close out with sharing your favorite nurse hack. So anything specific to pediatric oncology that really would help others in your field? Any favorite hacks that you have to share? Um, I, there are so many. They're not traditional ones. I mean, I think clustering your care is super important. Um, like I said, they're, these kids, you're entering their world. They have been in this hospital room for a very long time. Like I said, we, I've had patients who've been in the b two room for over a year and have not left it. You're entering their space. They're not entering yours. You have to, re, re, you have, to have respect for that environment, which often means not entering every five minutes. So figure out what you have to do, get all the things together at once, and then do it and leave them alone for a while. Let, let them laugh and cry and you know be kids with their parents. Um, Another hack with kids is being playful. And I've learned this with my own kids. My daughter is just like me. If I try to make her do something, she will do the exact opposite. You have to play with kids. You have to be let them think that they're part of the game, even if they're not. So playing with them and giving them um, agency is really important. Um, and then I think I mentioned this before also, just being patient with these kids. Um, these are not hacks, but they're, they're ways to be, I think. I like it. Uh, another question just came in. Do you have any tips for interviewing for a pediatric oncology unit and important points to emphasize during your interview? Um, 
Well, so for any interview, I can tell you, um, I was recently talking to one of the senior nurses who interviewed me 12 years ago, and she said she'd never seen a more nervous person in her life. Um, so I was all over the place, like tip tapping and just kind of um, spastic. Um, and I think that showed that I was, that I really wanted the job and I was nervous about it, but I would encourage you not to do that. Um, <laughs> have some confidence, um, practice a lot. Um, I think what these people want to see when they interview a person is that you have a passion for this field of medicine and that you are not there just to have a job and maybe leave in two years. So emphasizing your experience, emphasizing, you know, what you hope to learn, but also what you can bring to a particular area, you know, what assets do you have, what skills do you have, what experience do you have that can make you um, part of a team. Um, and then preparing yourself with actual, an actual background that supports that. So um, having spent time on a unit, having done an internship or a capstone on a unit, you know, you can't, you can't do better than that because you've showed that you know this population well and that you um, have spent the time to learn about them. I agree with that. And um, he's saying capstone, another phrase that you'll hear is preceptorship. So maybe your, yes. your uh, college doesn't offer a capstone, but interchangeably preceptorship. Uh, something that also you can do is volunteer in the pediatric department. Do you have volunteers at your facility, maybe like a child life or anything like that? We do have child life, but they're not volunteers. Do you don't have any volunteers that come in? No, oh. there are some volunteers. The child life is a very coveted position and they're like, absolutely. For those of you who don't know what child life is, um, they, you know, they really help the kids kind of orient to the hospital and, you know, especially with the new diagnoses. Um, we have music therapists and we have art therapists, but all these people are paid employees. Um, there are some, People, they call them cuddlers. Oh, yeah. They occasionally come and hold babies. Um, so that might be something that's available in the hospital that you're near. Um, and then we have other um, volunteers that who offer kind of um, poetry outlets so kids can learn how to write their poetry. Oh, neat. So I think that takes lots of investigation to see what a particular hospital provides and what you can get involved in aside from being a paid employee. Yeah, that's great. The child life facilities that, um, or sorry, the universities that I worked in that had child life, they would have volunteers that would clean the toys. So they would bring the children some toys to play with. And then whenever they wanted to switch out with new toys, they would help the children switch out and then they would be in charge of cleaning the toys that had been contaminated. Mm -hmm. So there's so many options out there to just like you're saying, get your foot in the door and show interest in the population that you're wanting to serve. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I don't see any more questions coming through. Um, I appreciate your time, David. I love the, all the information and wisdom that you've shared. So Tribe, thank you for tuning in and we'll see you again soon. Yeah, thank you very much, guys. It was a pleasure to talk about um, my job and my life. Yeah, we appreciate your insight.